Hello, everyone. It is so nice to see you here tonight for our talk on light keepers of the light, women of lighthouse. I'm sorry, keepers of the light, women light, lighthouse keepers of the Hudson River. And our speaker is Sarah Wasberg Johnson, who some of you may know as our food lit speaker who's given a number of talks on different types of foods and traditions. Tonight, she's wearing a different hat and I would like to introduce her in, uh, as the Director of Exhibits and Outreach at the Hudson River Maritime Museum in Kingston, New York. She has a master's degree in public history from the University at Albany and is the editor and co-author of the book, Hudson River Lighthouses, 2019 published on the, the auspices of the Hudson River Maritime Museum. She's currently working on a new documentary film produced by the museum called Seven Sentinels, Lighthouses of the Hudson River, due to be released summer of 2022. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Wasberg Johnson. Thank you so much, Giovanna. That was a lovely intro. Uh, so yes, that's what we were talking about earlier was uh, hiking down to the uh, little red lighthouse, Jeffrey Sook Lighthouse, was um, for the Seven Sentinels film. So if anybody caught the tail end of that. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about women lighthouse keepers for Women's History Month. Uh, this is a topic very near and dear to my heart. Um, the Hudson River Maritime Museum operates the Rondout Lighthouse, which is right at the mouth of Rondout Creek in Kingston. Um, and they had quite a famous women lighthouse keeper. And when we were doing research for the book, um, we just kept finding more women lighthouse keepers on the Hudson River. Um, I actually ran across initially a list that the United States Coast Guard had put together of women lighthouse keepers across the country. And a lot of them were Hudson River lighthouse keepers. So I thought that was very interesting in between that and the book um, that kind of piqued my interest in, and this um, talk as a result. I have given this talk a number of times, but we do have some new material. I was telling Giovanna uh, while we were waiting to get started about the partnership we have with um, and all of the, the Hudson River Lighthouse organizations, um, and they have helped reveal some, some new stories, which is great. So we'll just go ahead and get started. So the entire United States, <laughs> except for the central parts, uh, is divided into lighthouse districts. Um, the Hudson River is included in the third lighthouse district, which includes, um, you know, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Long Island Sound, uh, and the Hudson River. And you can see there's this little section up here that goes all the way up to Albany. Sorry, it's a little bit cut off there. Um, so you guys are in the southern end. Uh, the Rondo Lighthouse Kingston is right here. And the northernmost lighthouse today is the Hudson Athens Lighthouse. Um, but you might notice that there are a whole bunch of lighthouses north of that. So we'll be talking about some of those today as well. Um, yeah, so this is our, our more northerly section. Um, a lot of these lighthouses no longer exist, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. Today, the northernmost is Hudson City. There's Saugerties, Rondout, Esopus Meadows, um, Stony Point, and then it's it's further south, but there's also uh, Terrytown and then the Jeffrey Hook Lighthouse, which is also known as the Little Red Lighthouse under the Great Gray Bridge, right? That light, Little Red Lighthouse under the, the George Washington Bridge. So those are the seven lighthouses that remain on the Hudson River today. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about timeline. Um, why do we have lighthouses on the Hudson River? We have lighthouses on the Hudson River for a couple of reasons. Um, mainly the opening of the Erie Canal, the Champlain and Erie Canal, and later the DNH Canal in 1828. Um, but also in 1824, there is a Supreme Court case called Ogden v. Gibbons, which breaks the Fulton Livingston steamboat monopoly on the Hudson River. So it allows people other than Robert Livingston and Robert Fulton <laughs> to own and operate steamboats on the Hudson River and in New York Harbor. So um, once that happens, you get a huge proliferation of steamboats, which is also really spurred by the opening of the DNH Canal in 1828. That terminates uh, at the Rondout Creek in Kingston, and it's bringing 
huge amounts of anthracite coal from uh, Pennsylvania to New York. And so that really, all of this really helps create a steamboat boom and allows steamboats to travel at night, right? So when you're traveling at night, um, you're not like a car. If you're a boat, you don't have headlights to see where you're going. Uh, you rely on lights of other vessels and fixed point lights like lighthouses to see where you are and where you need to be headed. So um, the first and oldest lighthouse on the Hudson River is the Stony Point Lighthouse, which is built in 1826. That lighthouse is still there. Um, and then we get a couple of other early lighthouses. Um, really, the first generation of lighthouses starts in the 1830s, 20s and 30s. Um, and then you can see there's a couple of versions of lighthouses like as they are rebuilt, right? Um, and then there's another in like the 1850s and 60s, a whole bunch, a couple more in the 1870s. And then the third Ronda Lighthouse um, is one of the last to be built in 1915. The, the Little Red Lighthouse is, is installed later, but it's actually an earlier lighthouse. So technically the youngest lighthouse structure on the Hudson River is the Ronda, the current Ronda Lighthouse. So what does it mean to be a lighthouse keeper? Lighthouse keepers were federal employees. Um, really until the 1890s, they were political appointees under the auspices of the president. So the president of the United States had direct control, if he wanted to, over who was a lighthouse keeper where throughout the United States. In practice, particularly before the Civil War, it ended up being a lot of political patronage by local parties. Um, whoever was the president, their party controlled the political patronage. And sometimes you would see lighthouse keepers cycling in and out every four years. Because of that, the president would change over and you'd get kicked. One person would get kicked out, another person would get brought in. Um, but the basic duties are you have to light and maintain the lantern. You have to wind the light turning mechanism. So it was a clockwork mechanism usually that would turn or rotate the light. If there was fog, you had to ring a fog bell or in the early days, blow a fog horn. You had to keep impeccable daily records. You had to maintain the structure. Um, and then if possible, your job was to rescue any distressed persons. So really this is way before the Coast Guard. There's no real, um, you know, real organization representing the government operating on most of our navigable waterways, except for lighthouse keepers, which originally were under the Treasury Department, right? And then later they, they created a US Lighthouse Board, which became US Lighthouse Service. And then eventually that comes, um, you know, in the 1930s under the auspices of the Coast Guard. So just some pictures. This is a woman cleaning a Fresnel lens. This is from the 1940s. Um, but you can see if you've ever been in a lighthouse tower that has its original lens, this is a lot of what they look like. This is a little bit bigger maybe than some of the ones on the Hudson River. Um, but you had to clean the lens. This is an electric one obviously, but historically they would have been uh, oil lamps, whale oil lamps in the 1830s and 40s. Uh, and then you also had to clean the exterior of the tower and you'd have to paint, you'd have to maintain the structure. There was a lot of painting happening most years. Uh, so your duties are a lot of cleaning, record keeping, day-to-day -day maintenance. It was essentially a 24 hour job um, lighthouse keepers had to be up at night, right? You would wind the mechanism um, and it would go for a certain number of hours on the Hudson River that was like four to six hours, usually depending on how tall your lighthouse was because the winding mechanism is almost like a grandfather clock or a cuckoo clock. The weights would fall, like tick down, right? There was a weight. And when it got all the way to the bottom, you have to wind it back up again. Um, so if you had a really tall tower, like on the coast, your lighthouse winding mechanism might go for 12 or 18 or 24 hours. But 
on the Hudson River, those towers are much shorter because they don't need to be seen from as far away. So it meant more frequent winding. This is actually from West Point, which is cool. This picture is of the West Point Lighthouse Keeper winding, um, winding the mechanism to turn the light. You had to ring the fog bell. So this is just a good example of what a manual fog bell ringer might look like. Some of them were also clockwork. Um, the Hudson Athens Lighthouse, if you visit that one, they still have their original fog bell and the, the hammer mechanism. Um, this is a tilting manual one. Um, and then like we talked about, the opening of the Erie Canal really uh, jump starts uh, steamboat traffic on the Hudson River because it's just a year after Ogden v. Gibbon, so we don't have a monopoly on steamboat traffic anymore. Um, and that is really one of the primary reasons why we have lighthouses on the Hudson River. So these are the women lighthouse keepers that we know of. I actually just added Sarah Parkinson um, last year because she was a new find for us. Um, you can see that there are um, a couple of uh, a couple of mother daughter teams. So Christina Whitbeck and her daughter Anne, Nancy Rose and her daughter Melinda Rose, and most of the female lighthouse keepers um, were widows, uh, with one exception that we know of, and that's Kate Crowley, and she took over for her father which we'll talk about a little bit, but you can see we have a pretty good representation of women keepers on the Hudson River. Um, some of them are quite short lived. Sarah Parkinson only serves for like six months. We'll talk about why. Um, and who's our other short one? I guess most of them are, so oh yeah, Dorcas Schoonmaker, we'll talk about. They have related reasons for why their, their service is short. So we'll talk about them individually. Okay, so we talked about we're going to go in chronological chronological order, I think, of the the lighthouse um, the lighthouse structure. So Stony Point is our first and oldest lighthouse. This is a very early drawing of it. Um, the tower does not look anything like this. <laughs> it's much shorter, but this um, drawing is from the early 1840s, I believe. And uh, Robert Parkinson is really our second lighthouse keeper, right? He starts in uh, 1829 and he dies in 1834 and his wife Sarah takes over um, after his death. And in December of 1834, she is removed. She is a widow with five children. She is forced to move from the house. Why? Because Zachary Taylor's just got elected. So Zachary Taylor's government political party kicks her out. And there are actually a couple of newspaper articles that very vehemently criticize the Taylor administration and accuse him of hating women because he's removing this poor widowed woman and apparently other widowed lighthouse keeper women around the, the country and putting in his political appointees. Um, so she is replaced by Leonard K. Baker who one of the articles talks about, you know, like he's the able-bodied young man. He doesn't need this job. He could get work anywhere. Why are we kicking out this widowed woman? The trail runs cold after that. We don't really know what happened to her, um, but she is indeed a victim of the political patronage system of the day. And she's also our first documented woman lighthouse keeper on the Hudson River. Um, just a little bit, this is a little bit later on Stony Point, um, but you can see this is like the tiny little tower. <laughs> it's only like two and a half stories tall. And then there was a separate keeper's residence. Most of the other lighthouses on the Hudson River are family stations, which means the living quarters are attached to the tower. And that also has an impact on why I think the Hudson River has so many uh, women lighthouse keepers. All right, so also at Stony Point, Stony Point actually had three women lighthouse keepers, which I think is the most of any of the Hudson River lighthouses. So in the 1850s, Alexander Rose becomes lighthouse keeper. Um, he actually dies of an, I think it's an aneurysm or something. He is uh, carrying timber to build a new uh, fog bell tower. 
closer to the water's edge. Um, so he's working on that and, and he has an aneurysm or, or stroke or something and he dies. And his wife, Nancy Rose, again, several children, you know, fairly young woman, several children. She takes over as keeper and she is keeper until 1904. So for 47 years, she remains on as lighthouse keeper. When she retires in 1904, her daughter, Melinda Rose, takes over. Um, and I think Nancy dies in 1905, which may have been part of the reason why Melinda only stays on for a year. It's a pretty uneventful career for Nancy Rose. There was one incident that made the papers. So the steamer Poughkeepsie ran up on the rocks near Sunny Point in a fog. And uh, the, the owner of the Poughkeepsie claimed that Nancy Rose was derelict in her duties and was not ringing the fog bell. It's not clear whether or not she actually was. Um, some newspaper accounts claim that the people who were on board this Poughkeepsie when it wrecked, um, you know, climbed up the hill to the lighthouse and the, the lighthouse um, residents and were like knocking on the door and like Nancy Rose woke up to let them in. But then a number of townspeople in Stony Point claim that she, they heard the bell and she was ringing the bell and um, even the pilot couldn't be sure whether or not the fog bell was ringing. So she retires um, in 1903. She does get a service medal from the Scenic and Historic Society, um, Hudson River Scenic and Historic Society. Uh, and then her daughter Melinda takes takes over as, as keeper in 1904 and Nancy dies in 1904. So Melinda only stays on for a year. All right, our next lighthouse is the Stuyvesant Lighthouse, which is no longer there. This is one of our lost Hudson River lighthouses. And if it looks familiar, if you're a lighthouse enthusiast, um, there's a reason for that. So if it looks like the Sargonese Lighthouse, that is because the second roundout lighthouse, the Kaksaki Lighthouse, the Stuyvesant Lighthouse, and the Sargonis Lighthouse were all built from the exact same plans. Slightly different materials, um, but from the same plan. So this is actually the second Stuyvesant Lighthouse. We don't have a good um, image of the first one, which was built in the 1830s, but this is the second one. And this one has a very sad story. So um, Volker Twitbeck, is I believe the first lighthouse keeper in the Stuyvesant Lighthouse in 1830. And in 1832, the original stone lighthouse was destroyed by an ice dam while the family was inside of it. So a couple of guys had gone out in a rowboat to be like, the ice is breaking up. There's going to be, a, you know, this dangerous ice dam. So an ice dam, just to explain, when, when rivers freeze, um, they usually freeze pretty solid and the Hudson River did historically. And if there is a fast thaw, especially if the thaw is up in the mountains, all of the snow melt and melt water is running down through, you know, the watershed basically and into the rivers, but the ice is still frozen solid on top. So what happens is the water builds up all this pressure, all this pressure until the ice finally breaks. And there's like a wall of water and giant chunks of ice come hurtling down the river. So that's what happened in 1832. And that destroyed the stone lighthouse. Um, a couple of the children and grandchildren did die, but the majority of the family survived, including Volker, Christina, and their daughter. And not super clear when Volker Whitbeck dies. Um, they do actually, the local community, because they lost everything, right? So the local community actually petitions the president at the time. So it was, who was the president? Martin Van Buren. Where is Martin Van Buren from? Kinderhook, New York. Where is the Stuyvesant Lighthouse? Like right by Kinderhook, New York. So he actually lets them stay on as keepers while the new lighthouse is being built, even though there's not really anything for them to do. Um, and then Volker, resumes his lighthouse keeper duties. Christina takes over presumably after his death. We don't know exactly when he died. Um, and then Anne, her daughter Anne takes over as well. So there's also two um, women lighthouse keepers at the Stuyvesant Lighthouse. 
So this is there is there are some extensive reports um, about this incident uh, with the Stuyvesant Lighthouse. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but it is very moving. If anybody wants to read it, I can send it to them. And this is just an example. I just threw this in here of an example of like why we like corroborating evidence as historians. So this is a newspaper article that says Anne Whitbeck is the lighthouse keeper at the Stuyvesant on the Hudson River, some 20 miles below Albany. She was appointed to that position by the president in the year 1832, since which time she has retained it. Her husband was the keeper of the lighthouse previous to that time. In that year, the lighthouse was carried away in a freshet and Mr. Whitbeck was killed. Mrs. Whitbeck has on, an only daughter and between them, they managed to perform the duties pertaining to the office. So what's the problem with this? Christina is the mother. <laughs> Anne is the daughter. Um, Volkert did not die uh, in, in the freshet. Uh, and he continued his late housekeeping duties after 1832, which is the year that the freshet occurred. And he was late housekeeper before 1832. <laughs> so just an example of we like to have some corroborating evidence when we are when we're looking at this because newspapers are not always accurate. But there is probably a little tidbit in there. Her salary is probably accurate. And it's probably accurate to say that the, the two women may have performed the duties together. Right. All right, our next lighthouse is the Rhonda Lighthouse, which is built. The first one was built in 1837. This is an illustration from the 1840s. Uh, it's from Hudson River Panorama, which is really great. It's on archive.org if anybody wants to look it up. It is basically a tourist illustration of what um, the entire length of the Hudson River waterfront looks like on both sides between New York City and Albany. It's got things marked, right? It says this is the Delaware and Hudson Canal, right? This is the Kingston Lighthouse. There's a ferry landing here. And most of those first generation lighthouses looked kind of like this, a little four square, two story building with a bird, a bird cage lantern room on top of, of the building. And they were built, I don't know if you can totally tell, they were built um, on wood and stone cribbing, which was not super sturdy particularly for resisting ice, as the Whitbecks found out. So this is the only other known image of that first Rhonda Lighthouse. This is a um, Jervis McAtee painting from the 1840s. It's in a private collection. And if we zoom in, we can see that here's this little tiny building kind of in the middle of this entrance to Rhonda Creek, right? So now the entrance to Rhonda Creek is like all the way out here, right? It's quite filled in um, and we'll talk about why, but that's what the original one looked like. So the Murdoch family were some of the longest serving um, lighthouse keepers on the Hudson River. And that is in large part thanks to Catherine Murdoch. So George Murdoch, who had formerly been a prison guard at Sing Sing Prison in Osning, gets appointed as the Rhonda Lighthouse Keeper in 1856 probably because of his wife's connections to Port Ewan, which is just across Rondout Creek from um, Rondout or downtown Kingston. Uh, she is from Port Ewan. She still had quite a few family there. Um, Parcel was her maiden name. And so he, they get that position in that, that original 1830s lighthouse in 1856. In 1857, sometime, I think it's in May, um, he takes the rowboat ashore to go get groceries, gets groceries, stops at the bar on the way home and never makes it home. The next morning they find him drowned next to the uh, rowboat full of groceries. And the official coroner's report that was published in the newspaper said that it was death due to intoxication. So Catherine had three kids by then, uh, including uh, her youngest son, James, who had just been born. Uh, so her relatives and friends in Port Ewan, you know, petition the lighthouse service to let her stay on as lighthouse keeper. She apparently goes to Washington, D.C. with baby James in arms to plead her case and says, essentially, what better way for my son to grow up to be a lighthouse keeper than to grow up in a lighthouse? 
uh, which is apparently a very convincing argument <laughs> because they let her stay on as lighthouse keeper. Um, and she remains lighthouse keeper for 50 years, which is pretty cool. Her son, James, does become a lighthouse keeper. He is her assistant keeper from 1880 to her retirement in 1907. We'll talk about what his duties are in a second. Uh, and then he is lighthouse keeper of Rhonda Lighthouse from 1907 to 1923. So in the 1860s, a second Rhonda Lighthouse is built to replace the third, or sorry, the first. So Catherine is, is uh, spends most of her career in that one, 1867 to 1907. And then James is the first keeper in the current Rhonda Lighthouse, which was completed in 1915. So um, we got, 1856 to 1923, all one fam family, three different structures. Um, interestingly, I didn't put this in here. Um, so her first husband dies in 1856. She's appointed the head lighthouse keeper in 1857. Sometime in the late 1850s, early 1860s, she marries again, um, a guy by the name of Jeremiah Perkins, who works on uh, tugboats. He also dies prematurely, um, this time working on a, a barge that was under tow, right? So he was working on, on the tugboat and he was checking one of the barges while they were towing it down the Hudson River. He's down in the hull of the barge. As he's climbing back up, the ladder falls. So he falls off the ladder um, and dies in an accident that way. So she does not remarry for a third time after that. Um, but has her children to keep her company and help her keep the light. So this is the second Rhonda Lighthouse. Um, this is the, the river view. So the tower is in the front, but again, if you've seen this already, Lighthouse, you can tell it looks very familiar. Rhonda was the first one built from those plants and it was built of stone, not brick, but the design is the same. So, um, while she is in this lighthouse, there are a couple of, of incidents that occur. Uh, this one is a newspaper article from around the 1880s in, that is in a scrapbook that she kept. So we don't know the exact date, but it says, one morning before the dikes were built, the, those breakwater jetties that are there now, Mrs. Murdoch sat in her little room sewing. Suddenly her ears were greeted with a crash of glass. She turned around and saw a schooner's boom had entered the window and stuck halfway across the room. The schooner had been crowded into the lighthouse by its toe. So to translate that a little bit, Catherine Murdoch was hanging out in her parlor sewing, probably uh, in either this room or this room, probably this room. And, uh, there was a schooner and a tugboat trying to come into the creek. Um, it could have also been on this side, depending on which direction they were going. Um, and the tugboat tow was not leaving enough room for the schooner to get between the tugboat and the lighthouse and the schooner crashed into the lighthouse. So it's, it's bowsprit, right? That big long spar at the front of the schooner where the, the sails are, are fastened to, that crashed right through her window. That's one fun incident for her. Um, and it said before the dikes were built, right? So that's also how we know um, it was probably in the 1870s um, or possibly early 1880s. So the dikes were built in, in 1877. Here's the lighthouse. They built a dike out to here. Um, and also, I think this one also is that 1879 or 1877. I can't read it. Anyway, they built another one here. And here in 1878, um, and the Army Corps concluded all their improvements, including dredging, by 1880. So they had three additional lights. So there was the lighthouse, and then there were three red um, stake lights or lanterns on poles, essentially, that had to be maintained to help mariners figure out this new, quite narrow entrance to Rondout Creek. So that occurred in 1880, and that's when James becomes the assistant keeper. So it was probably his job to row out and check and maintain these lights. It did not have to be done every day. The lanterns had very large oil reservoirs, so they could burn for a very long time. 
Um, but I'm guessing Catherine Murdoch with an adult son, you know, she's probably in her 60s. <laughs> that was probably, she was probably not the one running out to maintain those. So that was probably James's job. There's another incident in 1878, um, a freshet on uh, the Rondout Creek. Um, and uh, Catherine Murdoch, oh, I don't have the quote here. I should, I should put it in here. There's um, this big flood and one of her friends from shore says, you know, if this is really dangerous, they're predicting this, this flash flood, you sh it's gonna happen tonight, you should come to shore, it's not safe to be at the lighthouse. And I'm paraphrasing this quote, but she's quoted in the newspaper as saying something along the lines of, um, you know, though I am but a woman, I know my duty. If the lighthouse goes down, I go with it which is just the best quote. I love that quote. <laughs> um, and she stays and there is a freshet. There's a giant flood. She feels stuff hitting um, the base of the lighthouse, but it's a tough lighthouse and she makes it through and uh, gets to view and assist with the aftermath in the morning, which was quite destructive. So anyway, that's Catherine. She retires in 1907. Um, she moves ashore to Pukaki, which is, um, a little village like right behind where the lighthouse is. Uh, and then she dies in 1909 at the age of 81. She is, um, I think she's buried in the Port Ewan Cemetery, if anybody wants to go see her. But that's, that's Catherine Murdoch, our, our hometown girl, local favorite. Um, and then, yeah, this is her, her obituary. Uh, she did have several children um, and they got married, her, her first son, uh, George Murdoch Jr. ends up as a steamboat engineer. Um, her daughter marries uh, a local man, the Wright Myers. And there are still Wright Myers around. Um, and then, of course, James uh, also married and took over as keeper after her death. So this is what the, the new quote unquote lighthouse looks like. This is a beautiful postcard from 1915. And you can see this is the jetty that they have built up like this ice guard around. And also the base of the lighthouse, this is a cement lighthouse with the steel um, surrounding it. And it's kind of in a point. And then there's also this cribbing. I don't know if you can see there's stone cribbing behind the jetty in front of it. And that is all to protect it from ice. Um, so there were not any other women lighthouse keepers in the Ronda Lighthouse, but we have stories about the last family, the last civilian family to live in the Ronald Lighthouse, and that was the Howards, Robert and Matilda Howard. And there are two little girls, uh, Lila and Esther, the youngest. Um, they're just the cutest things. We have a ton of family photos from them. Uh, and Esther uh, has a number of stories. I think she might still be living. She definitely did some talks at the Lighthouse or at the museum in the 90s. So we have um, some of her reminiscences there. But uh, just just another great family with the Rondo Lighthouse. All right, Saturday's Lighthouse, 1835. Again, this is pretty much our only image we have of this first Saturday's Lighthouse. You see very similar to Rondo. So in the 1840s, 1845, um, Abram Schoonmaker becomes Lighthouse Keeper. He actually replaces the previous Lighthouse Keeper, Joseph Burhans, again, because there's a new political party in control after the presidential election. So he gets appointed in 1845 um, and then gets very sick. And Dorcas Schoonmaker, they have several children. Um, she is essentially nursing her sick husband, who is bedridden, caring for all of her children and caring for the Lighthouse at the same time. So when he dies in 1846, um, she takes over as keeper and remains keeper until 1849. And when there's, guess what, another presidential election and the previous political party gets put back in power and the lighthouse keeper she replaced, or her husband replaced, Joseph Burhans, becomes lighthouse keeper again. So they put him back as keeper, despite the fact that a number of mariners, you know, write letters in support of Mrs. Schoonmaker, who has done an exemplary job of keeping the light. They had no complaints, um, but because of political patronage, she was removed. She ends up moving in with one of her married daughters, um, and then she dies quite young 
right? Only a couple of years later in 1851, this is uh, her and Abram's um, uh, headstone in the Saugerty Cemetery. So this is the Saugerty's lighthouse after the Schoonmakers, right? They replaced that original lighthouse in 1869. So just a couple of years after the Rhonda lighthouse was replaced. Again, you can see it looks very similar. Um, and the Crowleys take over. Uh, Dennis Crowley takes over in 1865, um, but then he starts to go blind. Uh, his son Daniel takes over for a short while and then goes on to you know, more lucrative jobs. Um, so his younger sister, Kate, and assisted by her older sister, Ellen, um, Kate becomes the official lighthouse keeper in 1873. Um, and there are some daring exploits, which we'll get into. And then for whatever reason, we're not sure why um, Kate stops being lighthouse keeper in 1885 and Daniel's son, James, uh, becomes lighthouse keeper for about a decade after that. So um, another long tenure of a lighthouse family, not quite as long as the Murdochs though. So in the 1870s, I believe, yeah, I think it's 1878, um, this very lengthy article about Kate and Ellen Crowley basically goes the Victorian equivalent of viral. It is published in something like 30 newspapers around the country. I've been able to find 30 versions of it in different newspapers around the country. It's quite lengthy and it talks about the girls and their heroism. There is one section in particular. Um, so the conceit is basically that the, the author of the article is talking to an old steamboat captain up in the pilot house of this steamboat and he's like reminiscing as they're going. And one of the things he reminisces about is the Crowley sisters. And he talks about an incident where um, a storm was coming up from the south, a storm was coming down from the north, and a sloop loaded with bluestone had just come out of Saudi's Harbor when, when the storm hit, right? The two storms hit, sloop went over. And uh, the Crowley sisters, like two feminine forms, came fluttering down the steps of the lighthouse to get into the boat to go out and rescue these guys um, in this capsized sloop. Um, and so it's two of them on the oars and then one of them keeps on the oars and the other one hauls the men into the boat by herself. Uh, and the steamboat captain goes on to praise them and their bravery and, and describe some other incidents where they had rescued people. And of course it's the Victorian era. So they are both beautiful and retiring and you know, a little shy and they don't want publicity and they take care of their aged parents. Um, and that's that's the the gist of the story and it, it goes viral. So uh, if anybody wants to look it up, we have it published on the museum's history blog, hrmm.org. Uh, it's a great, a great story. Um, but so a, a lot of these women lighthouse keepers, we only really know much about them because of the newspaper articles. And in the late 19th century, Thanks to people like Ida Lewis in Maine, women lighthouse keepers were kind of like a favorite topic for newspaper editors and, and journalists. Um, so we, we get some good, some good copy that way. So there again, there are only two women lighthouse keepers officially at the Saugerties Lighthouse, but there was one woman who was very um, active in saving the Saugerties Lighthouse and that is Ruth Reynolds Glunt. Um, she helps get the lighthouse on the National Register. She helps found the lighthouse, Sardis Lighthouse Conservancy, um, which basically saved a falling down lighthouse, did the huge restoration efforts and the Lighthouse Conservancy manages the lighthouse today. She also publishes Lighthouses and Legends of the Hudson in 1975. Some of the stories are probably a little apocryphal, um, but her husband, Chester Glunt, uh, worked for the Coast Guard uh, at the Turkey Point Coast Guard Station. And so they knew some of the lighthouse keepers personally, like they interacted with the Howards and stuff like that. So um, she is not a keeper officially, but uh, I'm including her because she does have such a positive impact. So our next couple of lighthouse keepers, um, we basically only have their names and dates and we don't even know that much about their lighthouses. So they're 
if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I talked about north of the Hudson Athens Lighthouse, there used to be a bunch of lighthouses between Hudson Athens and Albany. Um, all of them are gone now, including the Kursaki and Stuyvesant lighthouses. Um, but there were a number of more temporary lights and lights that did not have um, structures attached to them. One of them is a Skodak channel light, which was put, installed in 1852. Um, and it's just a little signal light, basically um, at the mouth of the Skodak channel. It's a place where historically the Hudson River split around an island. So you needed to have a signal light to mark the island and also um, to help mark what, what side of the island the channel went on. And so there's a record of a woman by the name of Joanna Lawton uh, being the keeper of that light for you know 13 years. Um, she's Mrs. Joanna Lawton. So presumably her husband uh, was keeper before her, but we don't know for sure. I haven't been able to dig up anything else about her. And same with the New Baltimore stake light. Um, again, there's an island off of New Baltimore. So this is a small stake light without living quarters attached. It was not a tower. It was, you know, like a wooden structure. Um, and this one again, Mrs. Eliza Smith runs it from 1864 to 1870, probably a widow. There were not living quarters attached. They probably did not have to be maintained every night. Again, kind of like the stake lights on, on the, the jetties in Rondout Harbor. They just had to be checked occasionally and refilled and cleaned. Um, so not as, as strenuous a job as actually keeping a lighthouse, but still we have a woman lighthouse keeper here. And again, it's all I could find about her. Um, Isopus Meadows. So this is the second Isopus Meadows lighthouse. There was an earlier 1839 structure actually here on this original foundation. And I don't know if you've noticed, but you can see this giant circular stone block foundations um, become the norm in the 1860s and 70s. And then also Asopus Meadows has like rock riprap around it, and that is to protect it from ice. So um, Dory is not an official lighthouse keeper. Um, and actually I didn't include her in here. I should talk also, there was a, a previous uh, lighthouse keeper, um, or do I talk about them? No. Uh, Manny Resendez and his wife, um, I believe her name was Ellie, was kind of like an unofficial keeper because um, Manny apparently was not around a lot. So Ellie, Ellie Resendez ended up keeping the light by herself. Um, but Dory, again, not an official lighthouse keeper, but her father, Andrew McClintock was, um, and she was really instrumental in helping the Save Us Up as Lighthouse Commission um, restore and restructure the interior of the Usopus Meadows Lighthouse, which they started in the 80s. And in 2011, I don't know if it's in print anymore, but she published um, a little memoir called Dory of the Lighthouse, which is about growing up um, in the Usopus Meadows Lighthouse. So those are my women lighthouse keepers. Um, if folks want to formulate questions, they can. Uh, we've been working on um, the Seven Sentinels film, I can ask questions, answer questions about that. We offer tours of the Rondout Lighthouse and the Sopus Meadows Lighthouse um, in the summers on our 100% solar powered tour boat Solaris. Um, and of course there's the book that's also available and proceeds of the book go to support the museum. So looks like we have maybe some, oh yeah, Giovanna, yes. <laughs> Fake news. Yeah, newspapers, 19th century newspapers are not always the most reliable. So it's always good whenever you can to get um, confirmation from other sources. So yeah, it just makes you wonder because you're doing research and you're like, oh, I found this wonderful article. And then you have to fact check that as well because it'll contradict the the records, you know. When well, that's people that's best practices in history anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, diaries aren't always reliable. Even government records sometimes aren't always as reliable as you'd like. So it is good um, whenever you can to get multiple sources saying the same thing. It's not always possible. Sometimes, you know, it's not possible to corroborate. Um, 
but yeah, I just included that in there because that is one of the challenges of, of doing research is, is uh, making sure that what you're finding is actually true, so. Now, I guess I have a silly question because, you know, all these women, for the most part, have families, had children. Mm -hmm. So were the children with them in the lighthouse or mm -hmm. were they off on shore and somebody else watched their children while they were? Nope, they, so, you know, they're pretty much, except for the stake lights and things like that, those are all family stations. So they all have living quarters attached to the tower. They're quite spacious. Hmm. Um, you know, Rondo, Slogarnies, Esopus Meadows, um, Hudson Athens, they're all like three, four bedroom buildings. Wow. Um, but there's no yard. Oh. <laughs> so, um, some of them did have gardens, the, the lighthouses that were on islands, like uh, like the Kaksaki Lighthouse, they did have a garden. Usopus Meadows Lighthouse, um, every, every spring, I guess, uh, one of the keepers would get soil brought onto that other stone foundation and like put a garden in, but then it would all be washed away. It, by wiped away by the ice in the winter, so they'd have to start over every, every year, but they had that the Rondout Lighthouse, the area behind the Rondout Lighthouse in between those, that kind of breakwater jetty that goes like that is very shallow mm. in part because that's where the, the Army Corps dumped the dredge spoils from dredging mm. out the channel, but also because it's just filled in. Um, so it's only, it's only like, I think at low tide, it's only like a foot and a half deep. Oh. Uh, high tide, it's like maybe five feet deep. Um, so that was that was Lila and Esther Howard's playground. You know, they had hmm. like a little skiff. They would go swimming. In the wintertime, it was frozen. So they would go ice skating and stuff. Um, and then in one of the stories she, she told actually was, um, you know, it'd freeze over in the winter. So their dad would take them to shore in the boat before things froze over. And then when the flats froze over, they would walk to school across the flats. They went to school hmm. in, in Pankaki, right? Where... Catherine Murdoch retired too. Um, and Esther tells a story about one day they go out and I don't know who it was. One of them fell through the ice. Oh. Luckily her sister was there and they, you know, it's not very Hold deep. So they got him out and went back to the house and got, you know, dry and warm. And then their mother sent them back out to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> oh so, boy. You know, especially if I guess, you know, maybe dad was sleeping during the day if he had to be up all night. It was it was hard to be cooped up in that that place with kids. But other other stories like um, there are a couple of tragedies, actually, at the Terrytown Lighthouse of children drowning. Oh. Um, but one of the like older boys used to go swimming and he would tie a rope around his waist and then tie the other end off to the lighthouse and he'd dive in the water and the current is quite wow. strong there it's right near the channel and then when he got tired he would use the rope to haul himself <laughs> back in that's smart because like you couldn't really swim back in when you were tired the current was too strong so so yeah they they would spend quite a bit of time in the water but but um most of the families yes did live live on site a few questions in the chat box do you sure. see elizabeth were there any women who became lighthouse keepers who were not widows of a man who had the job? And did men and or women go to school to learn the job? So there was not an official school. I'll answer that question first. Um, but there was eventually a civil service set up. Um, so the, the appointments, the presidential appointments stopped. I thought it was during the Civil War, but it turns out the last presidential appointments were done in the 1890s, right? So the political patronage lasted until the 1890s, and then it became more like a civil service position. Um, so you did not have to go to school. In 1939, the Coast Guard took over the U.S. Lighthouse Service, um, and basically once we entered World War I, the Coast Guard basically said to all the civilian keepers, you either have to join the Coast Guard or you can't be a lighthouse keeper anymore. So Robert Howard didn't say this, Robert Howard actually um, died in December of 1941. So right before the United States entered the, the war. Um, so that's part of the reason why he was our last civilian keeper. He was trying to help a tugboat or somebody had gotten stuck in the ice 
and he was out on the ice and he slipped and fell and hit his head and he had a stroke. Oh. So, so Matilda and uh, Esther and Lila had to, had to leave and move out and um, a, a Coast Guardsman came in and replaced Robert. And then they had Coast Guardsmen after that. No Coast um, Guards women, because there weren't any Coast Guards. There were women. not any <laughs> Coast Guards women, no. No, so that we have this long tradition of women lighthouse keepers. And then, you know, by the time you get to the 1930s, it's, it's almost all, all enlisted men. Um, most oh. of them, a lot of them did bring their wives. Like there's a couple instances, the Terrytown Lighthouse had a young Coast Guardsman and his wife. And I think they had one child um, that was in the 1950s. Most of the Rondout lighthouses were automated in the 1950s. A number of them were electrified in the 1940s and then automated fully automated in the 1950s. So um, with the exception of the Saugerties Lighthouse, which does have resident keepers who um, are caretakers of the lighthouses, and then they also run the bed and breakfast that helps support the Saugerties Lighthouse. The rest of them are all uh, unoccupied oh. and operated by uh, either uh, state or municipal agencies uh, or nonprofits. So, and Elizabeth, to answer your other question, I have not um, except for Kate Crowley, who took over for her, her father, and then her parents still lived in the lighthouse with her, right? She also took care of her parents. Um, as far as I know, all of the other women lighthouse keepers uh, were widows. And it would have been, I think, very unusual for a woman to be directly appointed who was not otherwise associated with a man in the 19th century. Even though there's some you know, like speculation that a lot of women lighthouse keepers were able to stay on as lighthouse keepers because men um, kind of looked down on the job because it was like women's work. But I'm like, it's, I don't really, that, I don't buy that argument. Um, and there's certainly plenty of men willing to do the job. And I think you end up with a lot of, of families doing it because otherwise it's quite lonely. Mm. You know, like the bigger coastal lighthouses, uh, including the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty was an official lighthouse until 1904. So from, from 1886, when it opened until 1904, it was an official lighthouse. And they had um, keeper residences on Floodlow Island. And I think they had four or five keepers. So there was a head keeper and then there were assistant keepers. Um, and so some of the bigger lighthouses on the coast, you would have more than one keeper, um, but a lot of them, they brought their families with in part, I think, because it came with free housing, you know, <laughs> like, mm. why wouldn't you at that point? That was mm -hmm. a, that was a decent job for a married man because it came with free housing. The pay was not good, um, but it came with free housing and it did come with some provisions, right? So the government would allot you a certain amount of flour and lard and tea and sugar and things like that per person per month. Mm. And you would get periodic, um, deliveries and then you were responsible for the rest of your food but interesting anyway okay so uh the other question is what happens when the river is frozen and the lighthouse attendants are unable to reach land so if the river is frozen they would just walk to shore right that people did that historically we did not have bridges across the hudson river um for foot traffic or vehicle traffic until 1924 so for a while, there wasn't any way to cross the river, you know, once the, the ferries stop running. Mm. And then between the time when the ferries have to stop running and when the, the river is frozen enough that you can walk across, um, people drove on the Hudson River. Wow. Um, there's a bunch of uh, photos and newspaper articles about early automobile races on the ice on the Hudson and the Terrytown Lighthouse was like the turnaround point. <laughs> from these automobile races. Um, I don't think they really moved to shore, to be honest with you, um, in part because then you would have had to have a second house. Uh, and also um, because, you know, you, it was never, you, you could predict when the ice was gonna melt and, and navigation was gonna open back up because on the Hudson River, they kept boat, boats running as late as humanly possible and a number of boats would get stuck in the ice because they pushed it too far. And then in the spring, as soon as stuff started melting, they would start running vessels again. Um, 
So, you know, the river didn't freeze until mid January. You had to keep that lighthouse running every night until the close of navigation. Newspapers would announce, you know, like navigation on the Hudson River is now closed with like dates, or they would announce like the opening of navigation. Um, and because it's weather dependent, it would change. So um, it was not really predictable. And of course, if you wanted to take a vacation, you had to find somebody else to come and keep the light for you. Uh, so yeah, good question. Some nice compliments there in the chat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Alice in the boat tours. I'm just gonna do a plug for the Marisol Museum. If you haven't been, it's not that far, you should go. Um, right now we're only open Thursday through Sunday. And then the boat tours will start um, for sure Memorial Day weekend. If the weather's nice, we might do them a little bit before then. But uh, yeah, we're excited. And you can, we're gonna have two Rondout Lighthouse tours a day, every Thursday through Sunday. Um, and then I think we'll do Esopus Meadows tours once a month because um, we work with the Save Esopus Lighthouse Commission and their volunteers to make that accessible. And those are both tours of the interior of the lighthouse you'll probably hear some of the same stories i told today <laughs> but it's cool to see the inside yeah. and, um, the boat ride is really cool it's a solar powered boat so it's very quiet uh it's an electric motor so it's it's really a beautiful experience to just to be out on the water um in such a quiet boat you can you can hear the wildlife you can kind of sneak up on wildlife Sometimes, um, like they have a bird watching cruise that they do, which is super fun. That's really early in the morning. And we do a bunch of other programs with like visiting speakers and sunset tours, all kinds of fun stuff. I'm actually, we're talking about doing um, tasting tours where, where I will be the food historian on board. That's so the I think world. like <laughs> cheese and apples. And I think they're talking to somebody about honey and maybe some booze like cider beer, <laughs> so. spirits some spirits, spirits. <laughs> yes and then we also do halloween programs speaking of cool. spirits so it's super it fun. sounds like fun lots of fun it's so fun you guys should you should all come it's, i will it's, make it i will place. make a point of it oh, oh darby um i think our limit right now is so the boat can technically hold 24 by coast guard regulations um pre-pandemic we were doing 20 um because 24 is a little crowded uh but i think now we're limiting it to 16. so plenty of room bench seating but plenty of room well if there's interest we can figure out a way we can yeah <laughs> start out from harrison and drive up there you <laughs> and, go and plan to be uh like 15 of us on the boat and we can go visit the lighthouse yeah that would be so much fun. We would love to do that. And Giovanna, I don't think I told you this, but the museum actually does also offer um, library memberships. Oh, and we okay. Give you, we give you family passes that people can check out and come Oh, for nice. Free. So. Well, oh, that's good to know. Yes, because libraries, we do have museum passes. And now that more museums are reopening with more hours, Yep. it's it's worth it so worth it with the library card you really gain access to so many wonderful places so thanks for letting me know that if there are any yep. librarians here <laughs> a few <laughs> spread the word yeah. spread the word oh and allison you saw the program oh my <laughs> in my signature this morning okay yes <laughs> that's my little plug <laughs> i'm so glad you were able to make it allison allison from our Westchester Library System. Oh, nice. It's quite an honor that um, people are able to join us tonight. Well, if there are no other questions, you could obviously unmute if you'd like to ask a question or you can type it in the chat. And otherwise we can wrap up the program. Thank you so much to Sarah Wasberg Johnson who has all these wonderful topics for us. And we hope to have her back uh, to talk about some other food traditions and so much out there. If you don't follow her food historian blog or and subscribe to her newsletter, you should <laughs> because it is fascinating. And yeah, I'll drop uh, um, I'll drop the links to the museum website and excellent. then 
my food historian website too if I could type it properly. There it cool. is. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah, I highly recommend it. And uh, we're fortunate that we were able to start off with our programs through Zoom virtually, right? Because it would be a bit of a trap for you to come to yeah, us. I don't, I don't live in Kingston. I live in the Newburgh area, but that's still, still a about long, an hour. So. Yeah, so <laughs> quite a bit for you to travel. So we're happy yeah. that we can welcome you virtually. So thank, thank you. you so very much. All right.